Hello, everybody. Uh, it is my very great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Bali Malhuji, who doesn't really need any introduction. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I have to tell you that I'm a huge admirer of Bali's. He is an artist, a curator who lives in London, but he has worked in many locations in Europe and in the Middle East and in South Asia as well. Well, he has participated in the LLF um, once in London and two times in Lahore. Once he was at the LLF and the second time that he was in Lahore, he were, his work was shown at the Rotas II Gallery. He also lectured at the National College of Arts to a packed audience of students and teachers and artists and faculty. And we had a very, very lively discussion. And that's where we became friends. So, um, Wali, uh, you left Iran as a teenager. Um, what were the circumstances that made you leave Iran? Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> yes, I left Iran as a late teenager. I finished school in, um, in Tehran. And after finishing school, a, a few weeks after graduating from school, we were immediately drafted into the army. It was the, during the Iran-Iraq war. And um, I think the Ministry of Education, uh, as a matter of course, would just send the addresses of all the graduates to the interior ministry or something like that. Anyway, um, I had, there was a, a, a um, military truck that came to, to visit us at home. And I had a nanny who, who told them that I wasn't in. Uh, so send them away. And then they came back two or three more times and there wasn't, there wasn't really a chance to keep saying that I was away. So basically people in, in my age group, in my generation, we had two choices, either to go underground at that point or get drafted in to the army. So I did, I actually went uh, and enlisted and I was drafted and I went to the barracks. Now that, that, then there's a long story that follows, but uh, essentially I'm one of the very lucky people who managed after uh, a while of this military service engagement to get an ex exemption so that I, can't, I didn't go to war because really most people of my generation a lot of people in my generation perished in war. So continually one lives with this guilt that one wasn't killed. And, uh, and, uh, and then I, I, I applied for a passport to come to the UK. And that was a very interesting, interesting experience itself because after um, the establishment of Khomeini's government, the borders were closed. So for the, for the first four years, I remember after the revolution, the borders were closed. The universities were shut down. So movement and thought became really the, the places where control had to be applied. Whilst the, the project was being established, the project of the Islamic Republic was being established, which has a long story in, its, in itself. And actually the projects I work, work through are very embedded in all of this experience. But when they lifted the, um, the, the bar on travel, all Iranian passports had already been annulled. So you had to actually go through the system and apply for a passport and then be, be granted permission. So anyway, another long story. And I was, I was able to, uh, to get that passport and then come out of the country. But this was also the time of, of really heightened repression that was being imposed after one or maybe two years of really liberal environment, politi politically liberal environments where political parties have been active and young people like me at school, we were already drafted into all sorts of political parties. And I was quite engaged politically as a, as a young member of the, of the school pupils movement of the Communist Party. But by that time, parties like that had literally been annulled, if not already uh, sort of damaged through massive executions, etc. So we were kind of left to make our own decisions. And what had been announced was that you either ter turn yourself in in which case we register you, rather like the Nazi times where the Jews were originally asked to just register. And then we, we don't have any problems with you or 
or if we if if we arrest you, then you need to deal with a course of events thereafter. So we were left to make our own decisions. I lost contact with all my sort of friends at that time and comrades, if you like, and I still don't know what's happened to almost most. I mean, about ninety percent of the people I knew at that time. So it, these are the conditions I left Iran. I came to the UK uh, straight after that. And how have you been back to Iran after that? Yes, I, I did go back very regularly. My family lived there and I, I went back very regularly. And um, I mean, there, there were you know, highs and lows because then more members of the family left Iran. Then we lost our home base in Tehran. So the severance you know, over the years has been, has been widened. The gap has been widened. Mm -hmm. But also what's very interesting is that uh, the Iranian circumstances has continually produced layers and, and uh, generations of exiles. So I would say out of the 8 million people who live outside of Iran today, you really have an entire cross-section of Iranian society. Most people who are leaving Iran today are, are really pretty destitute. Uh, I mean, they, they come from sometimes very rural areas. And I, I think, I mean, I was talking to somebody who's a human rights lawyer and deals with um, refu Iranian refugees, of which there are now many in Turkey and Greece, a very sizable proportion of them, of the refugees are from Iran, uh, who was saying that their, their work has proved to them that for some of these people, Iranian people, Tehran is very alien. So it doesn't really matter if they're in Copenhagen or if, in, if they're in Tehran. The real, you know, uh, economic refugees who are leaving the country with with very little education, very little skill, and really hoping that they will have some kind of a, some kind of a um, compassionate state to take care of them. So being outside of Iran is now very interesting. The diaspora is very interesting because it's layered with all kinds of Iranian experiences. Well, the, um, really, I want you to tell, tell us more about how you established the archeology span of the final decade and why you did that and what inspired you to do that. And um, I know that it's a multi-layered project. It's a highly complex project and it has been stretching out over many years. And um, we have been talking about this in our multiple conversations, but uh, at one level, it's a cultural history. At another level, it has that, it is a performative space. It has that inherent quality in which it can change and it can, uh, you become very, very experimental at times. So it is not a static exhibition at all. It is something that is evolving and changing. It is uh, also a space for introspection. It is a space for research and for imagining. So if you agree with these propositions, Bali, would you be able to talk about how you set this particular project up? Mm. No, yes, it's, um, you put it in a nutshell very well, Nazish, thank you. In a way, it's a sort of a love affair with history. Uh, and uh, it, it tries to also be playful. And at the same time, kind of look at, bits which are dangerous to know. So uh, the, the idea is to, to provoke a way of looking and a way of listening to history and paying attention to particular histories and understanding what it is that is happening to us now by looking at, at those kinds of moments in the past. And um, it, for me, it's, it's, re-embodying certain experiences, especially in a condition that I feel, especially with the Iranian um, experiences, history is so disembodied now. What's become interesting is that more people around the world are, um, I think, uh, let's say, coming uh, to understand this experience as more societies in the world don't understand what's happening and how has the world around them changed so much. Even the COVID-19 has set about so many crises in the way states deal with their peoples. Almost everywhere in the world, there's been some kind of crisis as to how the state has dealt with its people. And these, <clears throat> these gaps um, become 
really interesting areas to, to investigate. What I decided in, in, in my project was that um, curating is really a, a very good space for history. And if we can, if we can um, uh, bear to look at some of the things that we've already closed and put away from our past, we may be able to, uh, let's say, release some knowledge and subvert, in a way, subvert our own understanding of how it is that we've arrived at what, at what we are. So I think it could be this subverting consciousness and subverting our conscious knowledge, it could be rewarding, I think. And it would lead to things that we need to know. So in some ways it becomes really radical what I'm doing. What I realized very early on is that um, these haunted sites that I was interested in uh, worried a lot of people, in, even institutions and patrons they sort of kept away from it. Of course, most of them weren't very commercial. So that didn't help, especially with the Iranian situation where it doesn't make sense if it doesn't make money. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but um, also uh, it just became clear that there was an unease about opening some of these Pandora's boxes. And um, so a kind of psychoanalytically inflected process in my own head, having trained in psychoanalysis, what kind of equated it with releasing repressed material. And it really became an interest in history from below, in allowing the history to be told from the point of view of the defeated, and not from the point of, of the uh, point of view of the victor. In a way, memorializing the, the silences, the spaces that have been uh, decapitated and silenced. So it really became an archeology span of erasures and of silences. So I think that it would be quite interesting if we could uh, have a look at some of the images that, um, that uh, uh, the, you have put together as part of this archive. And for me, it becomes like almost like an allegory. And um, when you say that you want to talk about the voice of those who are defeated or who are silenced or who, who have been erased in a sense, uh, then you know, we need to look at um, some of the things that you have put together and, we, and perhaps we can also, we can keep on discussing how things have evolved as you've gone along. Mm. Because how can an artwork achieve so much is really a very major question. Mm. And it's a very, and in that sense, I think it's very exciting mm. because it's actually quite open-ended as well. Mm. And yes. it has these allegorical proportions and yeah. yet it's metaphorical. And so all of these are happening at the same time. So I think perhaps we should start looking at some of these um, images and then talk more about the traumas that are embedded in the entire project in mm. its entirety. Well, yeah, and it's actually probably useful because it's been such a hot situation in the UK right now, thinking about the statue of Edward Colston that was thrown into the, yeah. into the water. This became really interesting for me from my archeology span of the final decade point of view, because um, it was a radical act. And my position was that whether we condone it or not, it seems to me <clears throat> to be begging to be realized as a moment when history from below erupts to the surface. And it may be ugly to some people, but it's, it's, it's happened now. And what, uh, what is interesting is that um, with the plaque that had been on the, on the statue, uh, memorializing the man and his legacy as a philanthropist, of course there was some kind of omission and the omission, the factual oversight was that he was also <clears throat> involved in a certain kind of trade, trade, trade in human beings, et cetera, and ownership of his slaves, et cetera. So this oversight became quite symbolic and that was all what the row was about. And the co conversation, the dialogue wasn't working. It remained the statue on the, on the plinth and nothing added to the plinth. So it led to this outburst. But what is also interesting is to then think about making and unmaking of monuments and why cities, why, populations need to live under the shadows of politically or economically powerful men at all. 
is that art really? Is that public art? Or is the function of that sculpture really about uh, imposition of <coughs> power and, hege and hegemonic power from above, a story from above? So these are the ways I work with Maratology. It's like to take- So you are talking about, like <coughs> are you yeah. talking about uh, the power that emerges from below. Yes. And although that it is very, the voices have been silenced, but they really are extremely powerful and they have to, you have to give voice to those forces. Um, um, just as a little uh, um, discussion, uh, what do you think of Mark Quinn's um, statue that he's put up of this, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter with this female woman with her hand raised and what do you think of that? Well, I haven't seen it, but I've read about it and seen pictures of it. And I've also read um, um, uh, kind of uh, complaints uh, or criticisms that um, here we go, <clears throat> an ego-driven act by a white male British artist putting his artwork on the plinth, etc. I think from my position, it really, it, the, these kind of conversations really need to leave, basically detach themselves from the persons, the egos, but also, and also in a way from the questions of race. And that's why I raise the question of living under the shadows of powerful men, usually yeah. men, because they're usually all men. That, do, you think, I, that, <clears throat> do you think for many statue will ever be pulled down? Actually, well, his pictures are everywhere, considering that Islam doesn't really agree with the reproduction okay. of the male, but we have it in, in our country very much. Uh, but that's the problem. In, fa in fact, it seems to be a very much a kind of 18th century onwards European uh, proposition for urban space to fill it, rather like the, the, the height of imperial Rome, to fill it with powerful men, if we look. And I think in cultures like, like ours, we didn't have it. It's a 20th century notion to have Reza Shah or, or Mahmoud Reza Shah's um, statues in our countries as a kind of symbol and, and um, a symbol of a unified country and a unified state with a head, with a head of state. So these, these, these sculptures are not really meant to elevate the senses or enlighten the thought. And for me, they're not art anyway. So they're taking, taking a man down and putting a woman up, in a way taking a man down and putting a woman up, even if she represents the voice of the silenced, is somehow within the same discourse. <clears throat> so I'm not um, that interested in it. I'd rather um, public art was commissioned from artists. And in fact, e England has very little public art commissioned from, from real artists, which functions art. A lot of memorializations go up in a city like London, for example. Memorialization of war, of, even now when they're talking about memorializing doctors and nurses who fought COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure who's making it, but somebody's making it. And it's a really ghastly idea and a ghastly uh, manifestation of these figures, real figures, standing in a circle with their masks and their tools and their, you know, medical sticks and things like that. It's not going to make, it's not going to elevate the sense or open up my, enlighten my, my vision of the world in any way. It's, no, it's, I think we should, go, we should go back to uh, more serious matters and look at some of your work now. Yeah. So I was going to say that that's, that's you know, uh, demanding recalibration is what that act demanded, to recalibrate history. It's not about removing one man and then putting the reverse of it back on the pedestal at all. It's really about, uh, about understanding that the silence cannot go on in a deeper way, you know. Mm -hmm. and so that's what I mean about recalibrating history and breaking silence. So going to my work, I can focus on a few projects uh, that I've also been speaking about in Iran. I have to share my screen. <clears throat> Is it shared? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about this to begin with. Yeah. So uh, so, sometimes when I lecture, I have this title, Militating Through the Conjured Archive. The notion is that um, I've been focusing on an art object and beginning to realize that the object can tell us more than the object itself. Mm -hmm. And that excavating the object, which is already a haunted object. Why is it a haunted object? Because 
I've been focusing on areas of culture that have been banned, that have been censored, that have been removed from circulation. And usually they've been condemned because there was a reason for them to be condemned. Some, somebody somewhere, some political force, social force, ideological force wanted to condemn them. But if we uh, excavate the object, it's, it's, it, we can memorialize it, if you like, and put it on a pedestal and put it in a glass case and put it in the, in the museum, but it's not quite the same as excavating around it, around the conditions. So I, and I'm, I say conjured archive because I decide to put things together in order to narrate a particular story that I want to tell. Two of the projects that I focused on early on, it's about 10 years now, I've been working on them. One is excavating the, uh, the landscape of a festival of performance that happened in Iran from 1967 to 1977 called Shiraz Persepolis, the Festival of Arts Shiraz Persepolis. And another project revolved around a very fantastic series of portraits taken by a documentary photographer called Kave Golestan of prostitutes who resided and worked in the red light district of Tehran, which was a very specific area designated for that kind of activity. And those images, uh, one of each uh, represent those projects. <clears throat> now I can give us a, a, a little whiz tour of, um, this is just an explanation of how the archeology span final decade wishes to unearth sites of disappearance and write histories of and for the defeated, which, we have, which we've talked about. And, um, and also how the projects, curated projects in this way, believe that these, the debris of these histories summon the audience as witness in the now. And in, in, in order to demand some kind of redistribution of justice so that we recalibrate and rethink history very much like the, like the, the, like the issue of the Black Lives Matter. That's why I wanted to bring it up because it's very palpable and it's very now. And I think this uh, notion of the audience as witness is very important because what I'm trying to do with curating these projects is to imagine us today as the audience of those spaces. It's not, uh, it's not about, uh, it's not a historical survey of something that happened in the past, but it's about evincing affect and thought today in us as if we are the audiences of those events. Something that's really close to my heart is this statement by James Baldwin, which says, <clears throat> it's always most terrifying, most dangerous when elimination and erasure is done in the name of the public, or even worse, in the pretense of the protection of the public good. This is really, for me, really important because again and again in spaces like Iran, the notion of removing art, human beings, ideas, is really always couched in this notion that it's for the public good that we do that. And this, I, I always keep that very close to myself. And here is um, a little uh, slideshow of the kind of events that happened at the festival, which uh, brought together cultures from all around the world in 1967 is very much embedded in that moment of, of the awakening of the global south, of non-aligned movements, ideas of global of, of solidarity amongst the countries of Asia and Africa, especially Pan-Africanism, Pan-Asianism. And Pan-Africanism, of course, is very, very important at that moment. So the festival invites artists from all over the world and doesn't exclude Europeans whether Eastern Europeans or Eastern Europeans under communist countries or Western Europeans and Americans, and doesn't kind of believe in a standoff of cultures or in a kind of decolonizer, I mean, colonizer standing against the decolonized, but rather imagines a universalist uh, moment where equalization amongst cultures is possible through art, especially through music, especially through drama. And for doing that, they invite very specific people. So they, in a way, tap into a very sophisticated network of artists who are working around the world from Japan to America via India and, and, and um, Uganda and <clears throat> really all over the planet who are all interested in the same you sort of euphoric, why I call it the euphoria of transnational togetherness, who are really interested in a kind of equalization of cultures through art. 
And the avant-garde in the West are specifically interested in coming and mingling with artists from Asia and Africa. For example, Merce Cunningham uh, canceled uh, projects in order specifically to be there, in order to be in the same space as uh, Sardono from uh, Indonesia or Shantarao from India. And the festival had a, a mission really to equalize and raise the so-called third world, which they really powerfully called the third world at the time, on an equal footing and an equal platform with the so-called um, advanced cultures and dismantle the hegemonies of European uh, power vis-a-vis -vis art. Wally, was this open to the general public or was it an elite audience? It was um, open to general public. It had, I think in 1974, I found some records that said 40,000 people visited it. Mm -hmm. So 40,000 people couldn't be elite. Of course, like any, any cultural uh, project on an international scale like that, you would have the elite arriving on the opening night, etc. Mm -hmm. What happened, in fact, the notion of, um, and the, the festival itself, in fact, is, is primarily hinged on the, the non-elite in the sense that the, the curating of the projects equalizes uh, a, a, a ney player, a flute player in the Nile Valley, the shepherds who play the flute in the Nile Valley with um, uh, Shankar. Okay. Or Ravi Shankar, yes. So um, the, the, the ideas that they, they tap into are, are the ideas of returning to the essence of rhythm. And the essence of rhythm, they believe, is is, is decipherable by all man, all, all, all humankind. There isn't really that difference. So elitism is really not part of the uh, rhetoric of the festival. In fact, after the second year, they, they dismantled the notion of a prize because they thought even, even within the festival, there should be no hierarchy of giving prizes. But if you I think elitism, we, should, we should move on because yeah. uh, uh, this is so fascinating that we could carry on forever, but we have to keep looking at our yeah. clock. So I want to, I want to um, make a correlation with what happened also in 1966 in Africa, which was the uh, first world festival of Negro arts. And so, so 67 was Shiraz and 66 was the one off in Africa. And this sentence, you see, this is very much also in line with what we're talking about here. Art was never an end in itself, but a means by which the human spirit is lifted to ever higher planes of consciousness by William Greaves. So I wanted to play a little bit of this as well, because it's very, um, well, this is actually a bit of the festival. <laughs> I will share some further images. Mm -hmm. I won't have time to go through these, but uh, they're published on the website. Mm -hmm. So anybody interested, they will all be on the website, but it just shows you the sort of scope and the ideas that informed the, the spaces that performed in, for example, open spaces in the bazaar. Mm -hmm. That's actually, that's a picture of the public. You can kind of see the public. Yes. 
Yes, there's a lady with a little baby up there, the back row. It's Merce Cunningham, John Cage. From Senegal, quite strong. From Uganda, very strong. From Nigeria, Yoruba tribe, Yoruba tribal stories. Mm -hmm. Another project quite different, not as aesthetically um, engaged as art for art's sake, but always for the sake of um, uh, documenting the marginal citizens. So these are a series of uh, very powerful portraits of women from the red light district taken in the same period of time, in this, in this case, 1975, 1977. It's called the Prostitute Series, and it was done by Carve Golestan. So these hadn't been seen also for 40 years. They still haven't been exhibited in Iran since 1976, for obvious reasons. But this became a very powerful project for me to work on as well. So I will... Um, Can you give us a little bit of the history of what actually happened over here, since yes. some people may I'm not be with it? Uh, if you don't mind, I'll quickly go through the pictures. Again, they're on the website to get to the history. So these are um, these really powerful portraits taken by Kave. So what happened uh, a few days after the um, before the arrival of Ayatollah Khomeini in Tehran, the area was set on fire. And um, nobody took, nobody took, uh, what do you call, nobody took um, responsibility for the fire. But we also know from, from, from uh, newspaper articles and reports that the army stood by watching. However, what's very interesting, what I found is the newspaper entries about this moment. Over at the top, the very, very big font, it says, uh, a program, a uh, vast program for the arrival of the Imam, Ayatollah Khomeini, and smaller to, to the side, it says the west and south of Tehran in flames of fire. Now, the, the juxtaposition of these two pieces of news is really interesting, that it seems as if the, uh, the program for the arrival of our saintly leader had to coincide with some kind of purifying fire that is, is, is happening. But what's important for us, for me, is this, is this notion of war on vulnerables. Because when we go through our history, this is an image actually taken by Abbas, the photographer, that shows a charred body being carried by a mob of men. I mean, a lot, a lot has been said. I, I've said a lot about all these things because, of course, the, the, the men were the people who frequented the area. The men who were the people who set fire on it in some kind of uh, uh, act of purification and, and uh, absorb, uh, absolving themselves. The men are carrying the charred body of a presumed prostitute here. Now, this photograph, uh, Abbas didn't want me to re-expose it in 2014, 15, 16, and, and, and onwards because he had so much trouble about it in 1980 that he was still worried about it being re-exposed in 2014, 15 onwards. The other piece of information that I excavated as part of my sociological um, archaeology was this piece, this newspaper that um, is from the 12th of July, 1979, that talks about three women and four men being executed. You see the double little portraits dark in the center of the, of the, of the newspaper. And those are two pictures of, of um, the seven people being executed. And the story of the ex execution was reflected in an Amnesty International uh, <coughs> document that I also found from that period. Now, this became really significant because the execution of those prostitutes marked really the initiation of execution of systemic execution of women in modern Iran. Because prior to 1979, I have, I have um, documentation of two and now possibly three uh, cases of, of execution of women in the 20th century in, in Iran. But post 1979, we, we, we of course have thousands because now Iran has one of the highest levels of execution anywhere in the world. 
it is not one of the, it is the highest per capita. China is always excluded to Amnesty International reports because somehow we're not sure how accurate we accurate our information is about what happens in China. But if China is excluded, Amnesty International says that in 2016, 87% of executions around the world happened in four countries, both of us are included, in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Pakistan. I mean, that's really gruesome that 87% of executions around the world, bar if, if we exclude China from the global community, happens in these four countries. So, but what is, in, what is interesting here is the, the prostitute, the marginal citizen is targeted, the stigmatized marginal citizen for whose rights very few people, including very few intellectuals were prepared to stand up, becomes the target, the vulnerable, the, the, the vulnerable target, the easy target for the initiation of a regime of terror. And uh, for me, this is really important. Is a little again is zooming out of the the, the factual uh, details of how many there were, three or four, or who they actually were, and actually expanding, zooming out, and looking at the kind of context within which they happen and what they are meant to what they are meant to uh, initiate, because it is a very clear sign that if you step out of line from what is considered uh religiously ethically and ideologically correct we your your um punishment is rather clear and what is left now from the red light district is this because what happened after that is that the entire area was demolished it was bulldozed again who actually ordered all these actions we don't really have decrees for so it all apparently so happens in the will, the will of the people. A total and complete erasure. And it has all been replaced. The whole entire area has become this artificial lake. Yes, the whole area is, I think is that That's a very, very powerful uh, image. And when you juxtapose the two things, then you really get the sense of uh, the trauma. And uh, I think we need to just talk about that just a little bit about trauma and about um, the uh, erasure. And we also want to talk about the role of the intelligentsia in Iran to these mm. events that have taken place for many in their living memories. And what have they done about it? Mm. Yes, the, um, the area, as you correctly say, was um, turned into this artificial lake, but this lake is within, an, within a parkland. So there's a park, there's a lake, and there is a hospital. I believe the hospital existed uh, before as well. And yes, it's, it's, it's erased. I use the terms deterritorialized, and then, but because it's important to understand that regimes that erase in that sense, they never leave the scars visible. They re-territorialize. So for me, the, the park and the lake are an act of re-territorialization. And it's also very typical of, of totalitarian uh, violence to uh, remove even the traces and the scars of the, of, of the violence and replace it with something quite wholesome and for the public to enjoy and something of this nature, like the park. So uh, what happened at the time is that nobody really picked up the cause of the prostitutes. And it became, you know, they became kind of collateral uh, damages, it was the will of the people. And this will of the people has, has obviously, of, of course, always been used as a, as, a, as a tool. And what I see today when I look back is that violence in places like Iran and in any other society where violence is part and parcel of the political project is mostly delegated down to the citizens. So the genocidal uh, side, the genocidal aspect of the project of the Islamic Republic is in fact pitting the citizen against the citizen, which is played out incredibly well here because it was done by people with their own will, etc. And it was all cleansed and given back to the people in a much better way as a part. So, so can I uh, you respond to the, uh, to, I'm sorry, I'm uh, hurrying you along, yeah. but could you respond to the question in, uh, of the role of the intelligentsia mm. towards all these things that they may they may have been erased, they may have been replaced, they may have been, as you say, de-territorialized uh, and reinvented. 
uh, but what is the intelligentsia's role in all of this? I mean, do they talk about it? Are they silenced? Are they fearful? Uh, do they have some kind of voice? Well, um, or have they absolved themselves of that responsibility? I mean, that is also possible. Yes, I think it's very difficult to have blanket statements about intelligentsia or blanket statements about every event that's happened. But the nature of trauma requires you to, first of all, the nature of violence and aggression uh, has very, very uh, obvious effects in society at large, which is that it expects obedience. And when it's sustained with violence and when it's sustained over time, that is what happens and that is what has happened in Iran. And one is compassionate to what has happened because life and survival depends on that sort of thing. But obedience, tolerance, conformity, and at, at, at some level, complicity become the strategies with, within, through which individuals and societies as collectives have to operate. This is not just the case of Iran. And to break that, Naji, is what is very difficult. To break through that uh, is the uh, breaking the silence. My projects are about looking at how systemically these violences are connected. The violence on one citizen effectively means violence on citizenship. So uh, this is the moment where the laws are changed. So the penal code, the modern penal code, which was secularized, even if aspects of it related to religious law, but it was a law by state, is annulled and what is replaced at that time is, is the law of God. So either the law is there and basically what you do is sinful in, this, in the face of God or almost even worse, in, uh, um, you are answerable to the person who has been harmed. So it's a law of retribution. So it actually pits, pits citizen against citizen, do you see? And, and, I think, and I think that's very important. So I think the role of the intelligentsia here would be to be able to step out of, to step out of this kind of trauma, to step out of the, the integrity, the, um, the mechanisms of what is going on. And that is very, very difficult because we are very, as I said, disembodied. That's what happens when trauma happens and when trauma is sustained. So I can't really say intelligentsia as such has either avoided or has had strategies. But what, what is important is that for me, the art projects are an oblique entry into these haunted sites and is an oblique um, political criticism of what is going on. And in a way, taking a radical act so that the exhibition becomes a site of appearance, a site of performance and a re-performance of such traumas, yeah? And the only yeah. thing I could say is, the only thing I could say is that one should, as citizen, demand, begin to demand the right to no longer be subject in the face of God, but to be citizen in the face of law and equal at that. So these are the very, very complex issues that, that are touched on. Uh, now, I project. don't know if we have very much time left, but I would like you to move on and to very quickly tell us um, about what you're doing now and particularly uh, focus on the cultural atlas. I know that you were in Lahore and you were supposed to fly out to Moscow and mm. where this uh, um, cultural atlas was actually presented as an artwork. If you could get that image on the screen, that would be yes. great. Yes. Um, and uh, what then happened was that, of course, the Pulwama attack occurred and uh, you couldn't leave the country. Uh -huh. And you had to actually, all the airports were shut down. You had to go all the way. You were delayed by one whole week. And I don't think you made it to Moscow. You had to fly back from Islamabad, possibly to London. But yes. this particular artwork, if you could just tell us very quickly as to what this is about, because I think that this is actually a kind of an extension of the ideas and the projects that you have been working on earlier. Yes. And it's a far, far bigger project, actually. That's right. So if you like, um, if, the, if the Red Light District project, uh, you know, brings about radical re, um, rethinking about citizenship in Iran, this project has come out of the festival and if I come through halfway through, towards the end of this atlas here, this is, it may be a bit blurry. This is, this is the Festival of Ashri Asusepolis, and you can see all these different links to different individuals, different concepts, uh, and different events. But the idea here, it's been shown in Moscow. This is the English version, and that's the Russian version. It was a 30 meter wall, and it was presented at the same time as a very fantastic retrospective of Rashid Arain's. 
And as these institutions open up to other histories and they want to bring into the canon other artists, um, they also invited my cultural atlas to be a part of it. Now, what, what, what we look at in, in the cultural atlas is a kind of intersection of art, uh, modernism and uh, emancipation, effectively. At one end, I, I've sort of started in the late 18th century, 19th century, very much in, in the subcontinent, in the, in, the, in the world of India, effectively, with um, Lalon Fakir, a thinker, philosopher, and then later on Tagore, no, who's no. familiar to everyone. And over here, I had the Indian independence movement, but lots of um, activities, ideas, and shared aspirations, basically, are networked in my incomplete conjuring of utopian ideas and notions of elevating humanity. And they go all across the planet and they reinforce each other backwards and forwards from Japan to Germany, from India to, to America. And, and in the middle, we have, of course, lots of very interesting political moments like the, um, here we have the non-aligned movement, Pan-Africanism, really puncturing moments like the Algerian Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, etc. But um, what is really important about this is to be able to imagine the world as if what has happened since then hasn't happened, if you like, Nazish. You know, as if this, this, this inevitable victory of neo-capitalist order around the world, global capitalism, you know, proving itself right, as if that hadn't happened. And as if we can, we can imagine and we can dream, we can dream is, is, is that uh, the notion of, you know, I have a dream. We can dream that maybe another world could have happened because this network of idea and this networks of kind of humanitarian visions and, and passions really imagined a different world altogether. Mm -hmm. And so the cultural atlas becomes um, a conjuring of those attitudes for us to, for us to be able to re re reattach to them you know, to claim them. It's a kind of act of defiance, like all of these projects become effectively an act of defiance and the audience is implicated as witness, to kind of witness what could have been or what we're allowed to, to know, which we don't know, or what we're allowed to dream of. So can we uh, quickly talk about uh, Baalbek and mm. uh, your fascination with Baalbek and, and uh, the work that you did over there? Yes, the Baalbek project. Take the cultural atlas to ba Baalbek? No, the Baalbek project um, was a very huge historical exhibition about Baalbek, which is 10,000 years of history. Yeah. And, um, but in it, I'm just going to show you one thing, which is very linked to this archaeology of the final decade. So, part of it, at the, in, in the end of the exhibition, I had this absolute passion to produce this map which is called the Battle of Baalbek. And there are two Baalbeks. Uh, the Baalbek, which is the Roman ruins that has been built on top of much, much, much more ancient uh, religious sites that have existed there over the century, over the millennia. But it's very, it, it's become the emblematic uh, symbol of pride and nationhood for modern Lebanon. It's been, a, it's, it's an incredible, uh, journey in itself, but there, there, there are the archaeological sites, which are demarcated in this orange. They are owned, they are basically, they're protected by the government in Beirut. The rest is, is, is the city. And so there were notions in the 50s to eradicate the city and excavate even more and make Balba the biggest archaeological site in the world and the biggest tourist attraction in the world, as if the city itself doesn't mean anything and the people in it don't mean anything. So this, this map, was showing how this obsession with the archaeological site has created damage in the rest of the city, and how yes, so how um, and how uh, roads we, which have been built in order to access this part has damaged the, the other parts, the other real life of the city. So this this was a kind of uh, let's say history from below or history of the kind of voiceless. Uh, speaking out to the decision makers in Beirut. And it's been a horrible, horrible failure. Uh, there's a lot of trauma in, in Baal, but it is now controlled by the Hezbollah. 
uh, its demographics has, sh has shifted dramatically. The other minorities, religious marriages have left and um, economically suffered a lot. And there were like six or seven checkpoints, just the hour and 15 minute drive from Beirut to, uh, to Balbe, where everybody's checked, you know. So it's a very, very um, aggravated site. Of so lots is, this of project, is this a project and a site and a city that you're going to be, it's one of those things that you will be working on. It's an ongoing uh, process. So is it something that you have actually brought out, completed and made it part of your other uh, sort of wider concerns? Well, it was, it, it, there was an offshoot of this project, which was to create a kind of tree building, tree, sorry, tree planting uh, project in Baalbek because it wouldn't, it wouldn't offend anyone. It wouldn't offend the Hezbollah. It wouldn't offend uh, the Maronites. It wouldn't offend anyone. Uh, partly only because to, in order to unite the city just via green, because there was, I couldn't find any other way, but it was really embraced by everyone. However, Lebanon is a very complicated place also and doing everything and getting the permissions are very complicated, but that's also part of the, the attraction to go and do these things in these places. So, Wali, we are hoping that you're going to uh, come and work in Lahore. You have expressed this desire, and I think that collectively we're going to try to make it happen. Mm. And um, just, I just want you to talk about that a little bit, because this is an ancient city. Yeah. This is a city built on a mound. This is a, pit, a city where, where many, many histories are embedded and many traumas are also present in our here and now. Yeah. And uh, I think that that is something which uh, you're interested in as well. That's right. I mean, as far as I know, it's, it's at least a third century city as a settlement, mm -hmm. Lahore. It's also an intellectual center. It was yeah. also an intellectual center where, when India was whole. And I did look at the women's archives I was hoping to be able to do something um, last year with it uh, as a starting point. And the orange line has always been a problem. And I know already many people have done projects on it, but uh, Lahore is suffering also from a sort of onslaught of development and money being spent in certain ways that may be damaging to the infrastructure of the city, to the lives of its people, displacement of populations, and also uh, literally some of the monuments getting damaged. Uh, yes, Lahore is definitely, uh, you well know, that Lahore is, yes, uh, I know. is well, in my heart. Thank you, Wadi, very much. I don't know if we have any questions because their people have been so mesmerized by uh, your talk that uh, questions have not come up. Mm. Uh, but I'm sure that they'll be reflecting on, on what we've talked about and perhaps they would then be getting in touch with you. Mm. But thank you very, very much. Uh, from all of us over here, and we're fortunate that we could connect with you. Uh, so this is one aspect of the pandemic where it's made these things more possible. Thank mm. you. My pleasure, Azish. Thank you very much, and goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.